This episode is brought to you by MPB. Get cash for the kit you're not using or trade it in for the gear you want at mpb.com. Hey folks, in this interview, I sit down with Alexis Hunley and Annabelle Friedman. We talk about their new project, The Flaw of Attraction, and we have a discussion about NFTs and the non-binary. This is Twit. Hey folks, welcome back to another episode of This Week in Photo. I am your host, Frederick Van Johnson. This is going to be a really, what I would say, important discussion that we're going to dive into today. I've got two artists that have agreed to sit down with me and talk about some work that they're doing in the NFT space. And we're going to have an open discussion about non-binary and NFT and how all that stuff works together and what they're doing to kind of elevate and shine some light and awareness on all of this stuff, both NFT and the non-binary stuff. So Alexis and Annabelle are here to discuss this stuff with me. Welcome to the show, guys. How are you doing? Hey. Great. So this this is going to be a good conversation. I'm diving in. This is the first, so you guys know, this is the first conversation of this kind that I've had. So, you know, I've had, I've had a couple of conversations about NFT, mostly from what the heck is it? Why should photographers care about it? What are we gonna do in the future if like a Chase Bank or an Amazon decides they wanna start playing heavily in that space? Is it all gonna go to, you know, go south? Um, and then the, on the, the non-binary stuff too, that's a, that's a topic that I think a lot of interviewers, like we were talking about before we started the interview, a lot of interviewers will shy away from that just from the fear of the landmine of not using the pronouns correctly or stuff like that. Me, I'm diving in face first. <laughs> we're gonna have this conversation. So before we dive into this, Alexis, I want to throw the I want to throw the the football to you first. Give us your kind of background and elevator pitch of who you are. You've been on this week in photo before, but for the folks that may not be familiar with you, tell us who Alexis Hunley is. Great. Um, my name's Alexis. Pronouns she her. I'm a Los Angeles-based freelance photographer, kind of dipping between commercial, editorial, and documentary work. That's about it. Excellent. That's it? That's too short, Alexis. <laughs> <laughs> That's too short and sweet. I, I love it. I love it. And I got to tell you, you know, the, the, the name Alexis is one of my favorite names on the planet. I think I told you this when we first met. My daughter's name is Alexis. <laughs> You know, wow. which I picked, by the way. So, you know, I am a fan of that name. It's classy. Love it. Sounds Alexis sounds expensive. That's why I like it. It sounds. Right. I agree. Yeah. Would you, would you go to a restaurant called Alexis's Steakhouse or Sally's Steakhouse? Which one would you go? To? <laughs> I would just go if it was just Alexis. There you go. Just Alexis. That's it. This is Alexis. I love it. All right. Annabelle, what about you? What is your, what's your elevator pitch? What do you tell people when you meet them at cocktail parties? <laughs> um, I'm Annabelle Friedman. They, them pronouns. And I'm an interdependent musician. Um, I think people say independent often. And I think that's kind of a bit of a lie. So interdependent is what I'm going with because I live off of collaborations and uh, music is my main vehicle but i am a visual artist and uh, play with a lot of different artistic mediums i love it i love it okay so i want to dive in because we we only have you know i think we're gonna we're gonna go probably like 30 minutes or so with this conversation and there's so much ground to cover here the main reason that we're all gathered here today is to talk about this amazing new work that you guys are working on i don't know if it's finished if it's a work in progress or is it if, if it's still going but annabelle why don't you why don't you dive in first and tell us about this this piece that you're working on called the law it's called the, let me make sure I get it, the flaw of attraction. It's a play on the play on words, the flaw of attraction. What's that all about? Yeah, exactly. So um, flaw of attraction kind of plays with, obviously, the law of attraction as though it's one set thing, which, of course, we know it's not. And it's an expose on the multitude of selves that we all have. It's a zoom into um, a compilation of my own as well as Lex's idea of various gender identities as performed by myself on a spectrum of five different panels. So it's almost like a triptych 
but it's with five because there's a little bit more nuance when it comes to gender. Mm -hmm. And it was really fun. We basically made these composite characters based on a number of different people we actually know in our lives. And then I got to perform them. And the reason that it's a, like flaw of attraction is no matter how much of those characters and that essence I bring to it, when it's minimized to a two dimensional photograph, even with all of Lex's camera skills, like it's always going to be minimalized. And uh, that feels kind of true of what happens with queerness so often is that it's conflated and blown out of proportion as though it's only this like visual and sexual attraction that matters when there's touch, there's taste, there's smell, there's do I want to go to the doctors with this person, all sorts of other things that lead us to fall in love and actually or even just be attracted to people. Yeah, yeah, I love that. It's so it's so deep. And I want I want to dive into a, a number one of those a number of those areas. One of the main parts of it is just the genesis of this project. In so Annabelle, you were kind of the the subject or the target or the model that was taking on these different personas. Uh, Alexis, you're on the other side of the camera as the creator or the art, you know, or the person pressing the button on the shutter obviously was a collaborative effort. Can you take us through your mindset and your motivations for doing this? Absolutely. I mean, first and foremost, I'm always looking for a new opportunity to not only hang out with Annabelle, but to collaborate. Yeah. It's been a couple years since we've been able to work on a project together. And so it was really nice to have the space and time to completely flesh out a project, start to finish with them, uh, because we are so aligned in terms of like how we navigate certain spaces, but also just artistically that it was it was a much needed respite from sort of just the work that I've been doing to dive not just into a project that gave me space to play and create, but to do it with somebody that I really respect as an individual and as an artist. Yeah. You know, so when you're when you're putting together something like this, are you are you thinking like from an artist standpoint, both and this is a question, open dialogue question to both of you. Are you thinking, okay, I want to create, and the, the answer could be all of the above, obviously, but are you thinking, I want to create something cool that is gonna, that's going to spark conversation? Are you thinking that I really want to play in this NFT space, so I want to create something that could potentially generate revenue? Or is it, what, what is the, what's the main goal? Annabelle, maybe, maybe you could take it first. What, what's the main goal? If you could fast forward to 2023, and the work is out there, people have been enjoying it, it's generating income or whatever. What would make Annabelle of 2023 say, yes, we made the right decision in 2021? I think my initial motivation was completely to work with Lex because it's such a privilege and honor. And it was um, something that we had kind of discussed over time. So my main desire was to see it. And then once we started to formulate more of what it actually would be that's when Lex suggested doing an nft with this which i think resonates <clears throat> excuse me mm -hmm. which i think resonates really well um and we actually also want to do a physical component to this at some point so i will feel super excited to have it living both in the digital world which allows for people to visit it anywhere in the world as well as a physical form that allows for people to be amongst the pieces and kind of in conjunction with each other that felt like a really cool dream actualized yeah yeah there's so much there yeah you, know, you know in the 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 other side of it and before we go to the next question alexis i want to give you the opportunity to answer that too alexis of 2023 what would she say is yes that we we did we did the right thing when we were conceptualizing this project in 2021 I mean, I already kind of feel that way. We did it. <laughs> we completed yeah. the project. I mean, it's not complete, but like we made our way through a project. Um, but in 2023, I think ideally, you know, um, our collection will 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 be bid on completely. People will have our NFTs. Um, our physical pieces will be showing all over. Um, but mostly, what it, what I think comes to mind first is conversation. It will open up dialogue and conversation in spaces and with people that it may not have touched otherwise. And I'm excited about that. 
Yeah, like this, right? We're having this conversation and we're talking about the piece and, you know, presumably a lot of people will see this and go look at the work and it will spark that that conversation. Let, let's shift gears a little bit. And Alexis, I wanna, like, let's talk about the, the space of NFT and why you chose to kind of distribute the work using that platform. And by the way, speaking of NFT, Alexis, I had a conversation with Diana Sinclair yesterday. We recorded an interview, which was talking to her. I feel like I know even less about NFT now because she knows so much about it. It's just, like, it's just like effortless. It's like, oh, yeah, we're doing this. this you know, I feel like. You know, I've been on a desert island and this NFT party has been happening on the mainland. I haven't seen it yet. So, yeah, yeah, exactly. Right. Right. So, you know, from from that standpoint, as you look at the NFT space and the evolution of it, it's brave as an artist to drive to dive in on a topic like this. Right. Non-binary and all the sociopolitical controversy quote controversy around it or miss or miss and disinformation about it and then on the nft side it's a similar kind of controversy and miss and disinformation you know maybe not the same but there's that you know there's a there's the environmental impact of nfts and it's tied to bitcoin and bitcoin is going up and down and i don't know what it is so i'm just going to sit it out and wait you're both you guys are diving in head first into both of these things and creating creating art in there alexis maybe you can start with this you can start with that are you are you worried that like this is too much for people to consume at once and there's gonna be like oh overload i can't deal with this let's move on to the next thing or like you said before this is going to be a conversation starter and hopefully the beginning of an education process for people what do you think you know that's a it's a very heavy question but it is. <laughs> i mean ultimately what comes to mind particularly when i think about working with annabelle and the work that we produce like the work is meant to have longevity. It's meant to be part of our legacy together and as individual artists. So I don't worry about it falling into a trend or like it's 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 a strategic part of how we want to be viewed as artists. Um, it's, we're not looking at it as jumping on a bandwagon. Um, we're trying to get in early, even though like we don't have the in-depth knowledge that like Diana has. Like I understand on a relatively high level like why it's an important space and one of the things that really drew me in was the community within the nft especially like the art part of it, the nft space is it's not that it's huge but it's it's such a community there's so much love just being shifted around like artists are supporting other artists and helping drive traffic to each other in a way that i don't necessarily see um when i look at like the art space like on instagram or twitter kind of on twitter but the specifically within the nft community on twitter um looking at that level of engagement and like true sense of community is really encouraging to me in terms of like us navigating that space uh, and building that that audience around what we want to do, but also supporting other people that we find. Um, I think my only hesitation has been because, you know, this is photography and, you know, how I understand copyright and intellectual property. It's a little bit of the Wild West and mm -hmm. it would it's I still need to get a better handle on smart contracts and like how to protect uh, our IP as like still photographs um and how we navigate that legally so that we don't have any issues coming up later i think that's really the only barrier for me to not be you know throwing out more collections and more nfts on a regular basis i think this is a perfect test project um but i'm excited for as we as we kind of figure out these these other pieces um, i'm excited to go full speed yeah yeah you hit on you hit on a really good good part of that and that's the the whole idea of smart contracts and the i don't know i don't know if ambiguity is the right word but just the confusion or just lack of understanding around the the ramifications of releasing work like this right mm -hmm. so which which it may be simple it's like yeah it's better it's protected because it's 
you know, it's a smart contract and it's on blockchain, yada, yada, yada. But on the other side, there's been no core precedence, precedence, you know, or it nothing has been challenged to my knowledge yet that could say, yeah, I'll go look at Hunley versus Johnson in 2021 and, <laughs> and Hunley won because of so and so, so and so, therefore, you know, so. Right. Yeah, or just people's general understanding of how IP works with photographs. Like, if you're in this space, you kind of understand. Like, I click the shutter, I own the copyright unless somebody buys it out. So it's like, do other people in the NFT space understand that? Does it still apply? You know, if I if somebody purchases um, one of our pieces, do they believe that they own the rights to the image and can go then and print it and make their own copies and throw it on t-shirts or bags or whatever like that's that's what's causing me to kind of tiptoe until i have a better idea of how to mitigate those those hang-ups those potential well, yeah. hang education right you want to be educated and yeah and this is the so you're kind of looking at this project as a little a little bit of a toe in the water and yeah. Or a canary in the coal mine, whatever your metaphor, right? <laughs> so, <laughs> so, not. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully, there's no gas in there. Alec, uh, Annabelle, uh, what about you? Like looking at the, the the whole NFT space, and are you looking at it the same way? You know, from the the perspective of this is experimental, and just kind of try it out, or are you bullish on it? You're like, this is this is the gold rush, and we're going to get our gold. You know, what do you think? <laughs> I mean, that would be so sick, but. Um... I definitely feel like this is a great space to experiment. I totally trust Lex from the process of making this. I mean, we made this piece during a pandemic and I'm high risk, so I have to trust this person. So if I trust someone with my life in that way, then I also trust financial decisions that we make together. And that felt, you know, really natural. And so, um, yeah, I mean, I think my only hesitation with NFTs is that I just don't know enough yet. I've heard yeah. a lot of moralistic discussion about, um, I guess, environmental implications and things like this. But um, frankly, I don't really know a type of currency that isn't corrupt. So yeah, great. Yeah. And it's like our U.S. dollars have horrendous environmental implications as well as humanitarian disasters. So I don't know. For me, the moralistic part of it is something that I want to know more about as well. But I'm less concerned with that at this point because um, not to be fatalistic, like, oh, everything's messed up, but it's like, we do live in capitalism to my dismay <laughs> and, mm -hmm. you know, we have to survive it. So it, if I can do so through art, I think that's a really great opportunity. I've seen people really supporting each other through NFT collection. Most artists who sell NFTs also collect that I've seen so far, at least on foundation. And people seem really proud of what they are collecting so that's really cool i don't see that like lex said on instagram or other digital avenues thus far so it looks promising and i'm excited about that yeah it does it looks really promising and hopefully through these kinds of interviews my my personal motivation is is selfish and altruistic if there's a such thing as <laughs> doing those things at the same time but the selfishness comes from i want to start minting nfts and understanding i'm in the same boat as you are alexis or both of you guys just trying to understand the space so that i don't screw up you know and put something out there and give the farm away by accident or you know yeah. something stupid like that but at the same time because i have this platform i want to educate people along the way, you know, through having conversations like this with people that are further down the road than I am. And you guys are doing really interesting things. And why not? Why not have these conversations to spread the word and hopefully drive some traffic to your to your uh, foundation account so people can check out the work that you're, you're doing, which, by the way, uh, will be in the show notes for this episode. So if you guys are interested in seeing the flaw of attraction, just click on the links in the uh, in the description, the show notes. Um, I wanna switch gears a little bit, Annabelle, I wanna throw it back to you and talk a little bit about the, Alexis mentioned community and the whole community around that. And I keep hearing that echoed. I heard it yesterday when I was speaking with Diana Sinclair about the, the how strong the community is around NFTs and, and there are even communities within communities, et cetera. Can you, shine a little bit of light on that what does that mean like what is the community is, is it just a bunch of people on twitter instagram TikTok that are talking about nfts and what the possibility are or is it more of a structured community of people that are doing things and helping and nurturing each other how would you how would you position it 
I, I don't know that I know enough yet, to be totally honest, but from what I've observed, um, it seems like a lot of people through buying each other's work and amplifying it and sharing, um, there's a viral response to a lot of people's work so that they can actually support each other and generate uh, revenue because of engagement. So it's kind of um, an all hands on deck thing and the way that I've seen it, um, it seems like people are really apt to support um, all sorts of innovation. Like, yeah, I've seen a lot of really interesting things. Mostly I've seen what I would define as community on Twitter, but I'm sure that it's on all other platforms as well. I know a lot of people use Discord. I've heard quite a few tweets actually about um, from NFT like collectors, like really large scale collectors who are like, if you don't use Discord through NFTs, then you're not doing it. So I know that I need to get into that, but I'm, you know, a little, little slow see, in the market. See, that's another <laughs> barrier. That's another barrier because, because it's, you know, Discord, I understand Discord. I have a Discord uh, I have server, too. I guess, you know, but I'm I not know. really using it. But I look yeah. at it and I, Discord is amazing. The sound quality, you know, if you're doing voice calls and all that is just ridiculous. And I'm Seriously. like, okay, I want to get in there. But it, it, the, and you guys tell me if I'm wrong, the demographic that understands and embraces discord is that you can draw a direct line to Twitch, which is a whole different demographic and much younger than I would argue people that are now looking seriously or not everybody, but a large segment that's looking seriously at NFTs as a way to distribute their work. So if you throw a discord in there, they're like, okay, that's another thing that I feel like I need to learn that I really don't want to get into. I'm trying to get away from this Facebook thing and all. Now you're telling me I need to be on discord and there's nothing but kids on there, you know? So like yeah. <laughs> Annabelle, so, so speak directly to that person, that person that just made that statement. Like, oh, you're telling me in order to be successful with an NFT, I need to embrace discord. I'm not willing to do that. Does that mean that they're doomed and they shouldn't try try to get into NFTs? I mean, honestly, doing that would be speaking directly to myself because I have the same <laughs> hesitation that you expressed. So, you know, what I would say to me is like, you know, if you want to invest in something, then you have to invest your time too and your energy. And um, if you want people to invest in you, like I just think about in the before times when I was going to shows and stuff like as a musician, I can't expect that people show up to my show if I don't show up to others. So it's there's a mutuality that I think um, also exists in digital spaces, luckily. And um, what I've noticed where, where Discord loses me a little bit is that it seems to be mostly people, um, at least originally, it was like a lot of people who are gamers started using it as like a big group chat from my yeah. understanding. I know the logo itself is even uh, like taking from the imagery of a game console i believe like yep. xbox or something it looks like yep. but um yeah so and i could be wrong about that but yeah um i think that there's a lot of that's where the overlap is lost on me because i didn't like grow up doing that so i know that there's there are just like so many different levels of community and so many different things that people are excited about a lot of people in nft world there's a whole sub community that are interested in like fantasy sports stuff and that's mm. a, an overlap that I don't have you know like there are a lot of different elements of it but I think that um, even through scrolling on foundation and looking at su who some of the artists that inspire me who they're following it's pretty clear that there's a lot of space for integrity and I had the misconception when I was first looking up NFTs and when I just saw them on Twitter I thought it's these overly pixelated spinning bunnies that are doing nothing <laughs> and have like they're almost like devoid of meaning and that's what people are interested in and i felt pretty lost and helpless to be honest and uh actually the the I, I think that's true of a lot of things that are first presented on twitter i thought that when i first saw instagram before i was on instagram i thought wow it's just people taking pictures of their food <laughs> and then i like learned and it was <laughs> yeah. but then i also learned more and found a community within that and now it makes sense. So after investing time and energy, um, it started to become more mutual. That's that's kind of the journey that I'm on with TikTok right now. <laughs> it's like I get out there, I'm doing I know I wouldn't be on TikTok, so I'm doing all my research and looking and I'm like I don't wanna be dancing. I'm not doing it. <laughs> you know? 
so I see all these <laughs> pranks and dancing, and so I'm asking like peers, I'm like, okay, if you want to be on TikTok, do you have to do this kind of thing in order to build a following? No. And then people basically showed me profiles of people that are doing you know things that photographers are interested in so yeah you're right it just depends on on what you're looking at alexis oh and by the way annabelle don't think it was lost on me that you used the phrase the before times because that was a clear that was a clear reference to mad max <laughs> so. oh i actually didn't even know that but i'm so down <laughs> it's like it's like the apoc we're in the apocalypse now when it was good you know it was yeah. <laughs> It looked like we actually have water and food. We don't have to eat rat tails. <laughs> so. I'm pretty close to that myself. Oh, man, man. Um, you know, Alexis, I want to throw it at you. So looking at NFTs today, and Annabelle kind of triggered a memory. I was, as you were, Annabelle, you were describing the, you know, the, the pixelated imagery that, that people associate with NFTs. I was thinking Tamagotchi. You, you guys remember Tamagotchi back in the day? Those little those little toys you could buy and it was like a little animal in there. You had to feed it and care for it and all that. But it was a little bit mapped little thing that somebody came up with. Those could be NFTs now, actually. Uh, yeah, yeah. Alexis, so I want to I switch to you. And, and as we wrap this up, I want to talk about the viability of NFTs and kind of the, from the standpoint of if a tree falls in the forest, it doesn't make a sound if nobody hears it. Right. So with NFTs, we see people like Mark Cuban and, you know, Jack Dorsey from Twitter and these other people that are putting on NFTs and raving about how they made a gazillion dollars. My friend Trey Ratcliffe, sent me a, a DM day before yesterday saying, hey, dude, I just put together this NFT. I put it out. I made $300,000. No, he said, I made $100,000 in three days. And by the time I got back to him, I said, you made $100,000 in three days? He said, no, it's 130 now. <laughs> I'm like, so, and I'm like, okay. So, but he has a gigantic audience. He has a huge mailing right. list. He's, you know, he's, he's big on social media. He's got a name out there. So the point is, does does having an audience is that an essential ingredient to to making money in the NFT space? If no, if you create you know a great piece of work, let's say this this work, the flaw of attraction, and there's no traffic flowing to it, is there a way for it to gain momentum, or is it just going to be a pretty flower that sits in a flower pot that no one is going to see, and therefore it's just going to sit there and wilt? What, what, what do you think about the whole audience side of thing? I mean, audience is key. Audience is everything. If you don't have it, you're right. It's it's going to sit in that flower pot, but you don't have to have a million followers. Yeah. Um, and that's kind of what Annabelle and I have been talking about is like, how do we begin to build our, our little piece of community? Like, who is our audience? Even if it's four other people who care, that's four more people who are seeing it and sharing it and engaging with it and not just with the work, but with us. Because mm -hmm. it, it feels like a lot of times in the space, like, yeah, there are trends that people hop on to buy, but like people are buying also because they're invested in these artists as people. So it's like, that's how we're looking at building audience and community around ourselves, but also m the mutuality that Annabelle talked about, you know, supporting other people as well. Like I'm looking forward to collecting pieces. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I I'm, the, the technology just moves so fast, right? So who knows what, and, and I'll, I'll say that around the whole idea of the things that are coming or rumored to be coming out from say an Apple, right? So Apple and their, their billion dollar push into augmented reality and these rumored glasses that they're coming out with. And then you've got Facebook with Oculus and all these things. And in the future, you know, we could, we could see an, a, an era when glasses that are that have augmented reality tech in them are ubiquitous and nfts play a pivotal role in that where instead of your NFT, nft being kind of locked behind all these layers of this is how you get to it and it's kind of weird and it's strange wouldn't it be cool if you could just have like a qr code that you could look at and see you know pieces that you've purchased from the flaw of attraction series pop up you know so it, you know, in your house or you have it on the wall, there's a QR code on the wall. When someone looks at it, that wall changes to the one of the pieces that they purchased from the flaw of attraction. And that piece that is, is displayed, like to your point, Alexis, is governed by or what is showing up is governed by a smart contract. So 
you know, whatever shows up in the wall, you guys may change the flaw of attraction. It may become something different. And part of that smart contract is if like an if then, if it is 2023 and this thing has happened, then show this piece of artwork or it looks like this or it changes because of the seasons or something like that. That's that's the exciting part for me, you know, that you fast forward and look at where this stuff could go. And folks like you that are playing in this space now are essentially the pioneers. You know, I look at like I live in the, the Northern California area close to Sacramento and the analogy is the gold rush, right? That built Sacramento for the most part. And the people that made money are, yeah, people that were early and struck gold early and, you know, went on to do whatever, but also the people that were helping those people. And Diana and I talked about this, the people that were selling shovels and selling jeans and tents and food and stuff like that. Those people made a killing too. You know, alcohol. I don't know how many alcohol companies were born because of the gold rush, right? So, so you know, it's a whole industry that spawns other industries. Um, yeah, really, really interesting stuff. Alexis, I wanna, I wanna wrap with both you guys, starting with you. What's next for you? Every time we talk, you're working on something interesting. This time is is no different. What's the next interesting thing that you're that you're setting your sights on? So currently, I'm working on a project for the Aftermath Project. Um, that foundation, I received a grant from them as a finalist, and so what? Um, cool. Together, yeah, thank you. Putting together that project, um, still kind of in the pre-production phase, exploring um, the aftermath of police violence. So. Oh, Definitely. really? More. Yeah. You, you like throw yourself in the middle of this stuff. <laughs> so <laughs> the last, the la you know, remember our conversation, the last conversation we had was like, yeah. you were, I think the, <laughs> the interview was about you. Uh, well, part of the interview, the discussion was about you covering Trump rallies and, you know, all kinds of stuff like that. You know, in in L.A., this is like when L.A. was literally on fire in a lot of ways, right? Our last chat was the day of the insurrection. Was it on the 6th? We got off the phone and then my mom called me like, did you see the news? Wow. Yeah. Wow. And you were looking at that. You're like, I wish I was in Washington, D.C. right now. That's what you were thinking. right? I, I did initially, but then I had a job the next day because I was going to go downtown because um, there was some stuff going downtown and here in LA, um, I was like, Ooh, I can't have a job tomorrow. I can't get COVID. Yeah. No, no. This job. Yeah. yeah, no, you're right. I dive head first into these kind of very deep emotional topics. That's, that's where I, I kind of live. And I'm really excited about this one. It's been a little bit difficult to sort of lean into just because the topic is so heavy. Um, my project is focusing on like, what do you do after the police kill your loved ones? And exploring that visually um, using some still imagery and uh, just creating portraits in a more abstract way so that it's it's not so documentary um, so that we can explore the emotional roller coaster that people go on after their, their loved ones are ripped out of their lives. Will you please come back on the podcast and talk about that later? Absolutely. <laughs> Awesome. All right. Well, thanks for coming on this time. I appreciate you. Of course. Thank you for having me. And Annabelle, what about you? What's next for you? What's on the? Because you're a, you're a musician and at, and just an artist in general. I don't know if like musician seems confining, right? You're you're not. I don't yeah, want to say no, just I mean, a, not just a musician because that confines it. You are an artist who also does music and uh, these other things. What what's next for your career? Um, I'm working on an album right now. So that's what, what uh, yeah, so that's what my focus is on. I have an EP that's out, but I'm working on my first full length. And actually during this time, um, I've dabbled with producing uh, my own music for, you know, lightly for years. But during this time, because it was like, okay, now it's just you here by yourself. Like, let's get it popping. Yeah. Um, I started actually producing music. So it. I feel really excited because, I mean, you know, with Lex talking about emotionality, I think that anyone who didn't dive into themselves during this time really, honestly, I think has missed an opportunity. Not that you can't in the future as well, but, yeah. um, you know, uh, so there's a lot of really uh, intentional things that I feel really proud to have said, and I'm excited to share that. And um, I'm at the point where I'm 
delicately dancing around what collaborations can look like with as much integrity as possible because we're still in a pandemic. Um, yeah, but I feel really proud of the people who are working on this with me and it's just so blessed and grateful. I love that. I love it. Okay, so for forgive my ignorance because I'm not a musician and I don't understand that world, but when you say working on an album, like what is what does that mean? Are you because this is what I picture as a layperson that you have a, a pad and a paper and you're sitting under a tree somewhere writing lyrics, scratching lines out, writing lyrics, and you know what what does it look like to for a real it, artist like yourself to work on an album? It totally could be that everyone who does that is also a real artist. Um, I personally, this is my first time with this process. I think every song has a totally different process but um because of the nature of this these chapters these many chapters <laughs> um <laughs> it's felt like you know a lot of stuff i've started just writing i play violin and mandolin and uh ukulele mostly to like start writing stuff and then uh have been starting to lay down some of the bass lines and drum parts myself too just kind of as like a map but what i'm I've done is take a production as far as I can and then I'm having um, drummer, bassist and keyboardist in a collective session so that we can have lay that component of the band down in the room and that that's all getting um, sound engineered and like co-produced with my friend Rachel White who's a phenomenal producer and sound engineer as well and uh, yeah a lot of people I really trust so I feel super super grateful because you know it's like having worked on music for a while um there's really been an opportunity luckily before this time for me to have already worked with literally everyone mm -hmm. <laughs> who i'm working with during this time and so you know we've kept up just personally over this time too while i was working in a more insular way um i've just checked in on people like how you doing what's your day like or how's your family or whatever you know so it feels um really like a, a potluck if anything yeah yeah that's so cool like a buffet right? so, yeah yeah everybody's like here's my offering i'm like what you brought that that was so sick thank you <laughs> <laughs> that's awesome i've had a craving for that so I what do you what is it what is it, cause your last question is completely off topic but and I was literally just just what last night or night before last on my iPad just looking at YouTube videos and running garage band and wondering like I was literally wondering this like can are we at a point today where someone could create an entire album using just an iPad. Have we have we gotten to that point in history where the old days of logic and having the big board, the soundboard and the studio and the artist behind the glass and all that stuff is that is that now the old school cliche to be replaced by MacBook Pros and iPads or is it an and? I don't know. What do you what do you oh, think? I totally think it's an and. Um personally, I don't think that there's there's such a distinction like you know, um, I plan to run this project through tape at the end, so I really want to marry the world. There's a lot of, of like digital with analog, and there's something different to capture a drum set through the air in the room. Um, that's something that I really feel excited about. And there's also a different energy that like, no matter if you play the same notes, there's a different energy if you're playing it live. And I don't think one's better than the other. Um, yeah. I think that they can be in conversation with each other. Um, I really don't appreciate the righteousness that happens in either direction where it's like they're combated against each other. Like mm -hmm. it, innovation has always been a component of music. There was a point when we didn't have synthesizers at all. And when that was really disruptive to the music industry and what we thought the future would mean. And same with an electric guitar that was like, no, you're ruining music. And I mean, even like... <laughs> Uh, T-Pain was told that he ruined music by a lot of people for using autotune in such a creative way. And like he can sing and he writes incredible songs and works his ass off and produces all his stuff. So I think that the animosity that musicians have with the industry has with innovation. That's just like, a part of the game. So uh, I don't think by myself I marry those worlds. I also I just like bear witness to a lot of musicians who already actively bridge those gaps and um, 
you know, working with Rachel, like the studio that she's working out of, there's just like such an amalgamation of new things. There are, you know, full uh, like 20 channel mix board sort of situations. And then there's like the, I don't know, there will be like tons of different like synths and then an actual piano upright. Yeah. And having a marriage of those sounds is pretty magic. So that's what I am drawn towards. Personally. Isn't that weird? That is weird how uh, it, I think human nature, I was going to say photographers or artists, but it's just humans tend to gravitate to the word or versus and. <laughs> Right, yeah. right. Which goes back to our whole non-binary discussion, right? So it's always it's always an or. Like in the photography world, it's raw versus JPEG. If you you know, only real photographers shoot raw, and before that, it was film versus digital. Only real photographers shoot film, and before that, it was painting versus photography. Only real artists paint, you know. So it was is always an or when, like you're saying, Annabelle, the the and is so much more exciting than the or because now you're you know like they say there's nothing new under the sun but there are lots of combinations of things that are brand new that we can yes. we can experiment with um all right want to leave it there uh, uh alexis i want to throw it to you for the both of you i'm going to give you the chance to give the last word the soundbite last word for the people that are that are interested in the flaw of attraction they're they're curious about nfts the whole conversation that we've had if you had to sum it up what would you say to them you know this is this is your chance to get on stage and put the camera on you you're you're on stage now what, <laughs> what do you what do you say to people that are curious about this whole space Ooh. message us we like to chat we may not be experts in the nft space but we're happy to chat about our project um, and engage in those conversations respectfully, of course, um, and build that sense of community in any way that makes sense. Love it. Annabelle, I'll give you the last word. Spotlight camera is on you. You're on stage, the Grammys, you're giving your acceptance speech. <laughs> what do you say? I, I, I would love to point out that X and I also had this concept for over a few years and we actually really find it up until this point so um i hope that people engage with us i hope that people want to community with us and um as far as uh the whole element of non-binary i would love to share a quote or a paraphrased quote from alok Menon that basically uh they argue that Non-binary is less about comprehension and more about compassion. So you, even if you don't understand, that's not the goal. You don't have to understand something in order to treat someone with dignity. Love it. Love it. I don't understand photosynthesis, but flowers are amazing. Right? So, exactly. <laughs> right. Love it. Uh, URLs. So I'll put the, like I said at the beginning, I'll put the URLs for the for your foundation and websites, et cetera, in the show notes. But for people that are, you know, driving or something right now, uh, Annabelle, what's a good location for people to go to connect with you, see some of the stuff you're working on, music, et cetera? What's a good location? Oh, um, I'm on Instagram, Twitter, and those are the main two that I'm really on, but I'm on TikTok as well, but it's um, at Annabelle Friedman on Instagram, which is A-N-N-A-B-E-L-L-E-F-R-E-E-D-M-A-N, and then on Twitter, it's just at Bell Friedman, so same spelling. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for coming on. I appreciate you. Yeah, thank you so much. All right, and Alexis Hunley, if people want to check out some of the stuff that you're working on and maybe get a get a an early seat into that police you know murder thing that you're working on <laughs> what's <laughs> what's the best place to go uh, you can find me on instagram twitter and our on foundation um it's just at by alexis hunley b-y-a-l-e-x-i-s-h-u-n-l-e-y -E -E and then my website is just alexishunley.com Excellent. All right. Thank you both for coming on. I appreciate you. It's been a fantastic interview and we went a, bit, a little bit over. I only thought we were going to go for like 20, 30 minutes. It's, we're now at the top of the hour. So obviously it was a good conversation. And there's so much more to cover. Like one of the things I want to talk about that we didn't get to talk about was trolls and how... <laughs> 
how this is basically, you know, a project like the Flaw of Attraction and probably this interview, right, is going to be a magnet for trolls and people that don't that have differing opinions or whatever, which, you know, makes the world go round, of course. You got to have a cold front and a warm front, right? So, yeah, when when you guys come back as the work is out there and has marinated a little bit more, we'll have you back and we'll talk about the success of it and how you were able to buy your matching Lamborghinis based on the proceeds from from the flaw of attraction. <laughs> so, all right, well, cool. Well, thank you both, and uh, we'll see you next time. Have a good rest of your week. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, cheers. This is Twitter. This episode was sponsored by MPB, the world's largest online platform for used photo and video kit. Visit mpb.com.